What's up, YouTube? Capital G here, making a quick video, giving you guys some tips as to how you can make money off of Yu Gi Oh! How you guys can use the secondary market as a resource to basically offset the high price of keeping up with the game, especially on a competitive level, and just kind of make it a lot easier for you guys to pick up new cards. I get comments all the time of people telling me how expensive the game is, and I completely understand. If you are not a full time working adult, this game can be a nightmare on your wallet. And, you know, we had this problem when I was a teenager nature too guys when i started playing Yu-Gi-Oh, i was like 16 years old somewhere around that and there were cards like mirror force and jinzo that you know you might not believe it now because those cards are worth like a fucking penny but you know at the time those cards were worth like 40 dollars each now we didn't have any like 150 dollar cards well not ones that you needed in the matter those were like tournament pack edition cards but the thing is Yu -Gi Oh has always had expensive cards and the secondary market has always been just a large factor in Yu -Gi Oh. i think Yu -Gi Oh is probably always going to have expensive cards as long as we have different rarities and I don't think that they should take out rarities out of the game. So anyways, I will say that this is a method that pretty much anybody who has any type of, I guess, starting resources, you will need some money to kind of, some money or some cards to pretty much start with this method. Like you'll need, I don't know, at least 20 or $30 to kind of like, you know, start kind of dipping in the secondary market. And I will say that it doesn't matter your level of competitiveness or even really kind of like your, your, you know, the, your skill in the game. Like you really don't have to be a good player to make a lot of money in the secondary market, but there's there is risk involved um certain things are just kind of unavoidable like konami banning things on the ban list and reprints those are just two things that generally nobody knows when those things are going to happen so my first tip comes to sneak peeks and it's general rule of thumb is you want to sell at sneak peeks and do not buy a lot of cards see the thing about sneak peeks is there's always a whole lot of buzz and a whole lot of excitement and you get a lot of people who are just kind of like they're a little desperate they see the card and they're like oh my god i want that card that's amazing i can't believe you pulled that this is the perfect opportunity to sell high on cards a lot of times prices go down because it's kind of like supply and demand when the sneak peek happens there's just not a lot of supply of of the kind of chase cards in the set and if you're lucky enough to be able to get those sell them online immediately because the prices almost always go down even when a card is extremely good you know the week after when there is kind of like the uh the worldwide release or kind of like the full release of the set the market just basically gets flooded i mean look at these cards like dimension barrier and totally awesome uh basically a week ago these were both 70 dollars cards and now on tcg player they're 55 and 51 dollars and it's just because everyone bought a bunch of boxes and then pulled them and immediately tried to sell them but the market is too flooded and basically they're constantly undercutting each other so if you would have pulled this at the sneak peek a week ago before you know a lot of people even had the card you could have instantly sold this card i also do not advocate buying a lot of cards at sneak peek because it's actually very rare that you know super high-end cards will like skyrocket up in price there are some examples of that i'm not going to sit here and ignore and say that this is always the rule because there are examples like solemn warning tour guide from the underworld uh dante of the burning abyss pot of desires those are all cards that basically came out at 35 dollars and then they you know kind of went to like a hundred dollars as an average price those are good examples but those have to be cards that you guys can identify and the thing about it is they're generally hard to identify because they're cards that are just kind of underrated by the Yu-Gi-Oh community if you see a card that is like secret rare and it comes out at like thirty dollars don't be afraid to invest in it if you think that it is going to be a completely format defining card if you're looking at it and you're thinking wow i can see this card being so good that like every deck in a play every deck in a game plays it or a tier one deck plays it and i know this deck is going to be tier one to be completely honest a card like dimensional barrier has this potential where people in the ocg are citing three copies of it but right now the market's flooded so it could have a chance at getting that a hundred dollar level but we we have seen it happen with cards like pot of desires and tour guide from the underworld cards that were completely meta defining you know they come out and nobody really thinks a lot about them and why it is kind of a high risk investment i mean think about it like this if you guys would have picked up three copies of pot of desires for $35 each when it came out at the sneak peek, you'd have spent what, $105? And then right now you'd be able to flip them for $90 each. I actually sold my two pots for, um, 
$180 and I think I bought them right before they like super shot up. It was right when I made that video about pot being $100. I found the two of them on eBay for $112. So, I mean, even me being very late to the party, I was still able to make, you know, like 40, 50, 60 dollars off the card. The second thing is identifying trends in the OCG and identifying where the competitive meta is going to be. You kind of have to be looking forward with this. Like you kind of have to always be kind of looking forward. You can't really be in the now because when you're in the now things are too late they've already happened a lot of times you can look at the ocg unless of course it's a tcg exclusive that's pretty much what happened with Dante. That's why no one really saw that one coming because there really wasn't any evidence to go off of. Dante was a TCG exclusive card. OCG never had it. But a lot of times, if you look at the OCG, you can see when decks are going to become incredibly good. And you can pick up key cards in those decks and you can get them a lot of times for cheap because people aren't really looking to get them. And you guys know just usually before, you know, two or three weeks before these uh, decks kind of hit the uh, TCG, the prices start really, really spiking. Look at ABC as a prime example, right? Bujin Tsukiyomi was, I think I sold mine last week for like $25, right? But that's a card that we knew about ABCs, mm, what'd you guys say, that six months ago we knew that ABCs were basically like borderline tier zero in the OCG? I, I would say that, right? I mean, we started knowing about ABCs about six months ago. If you would have looked at the OCG and maybe three and a half months ago said, damn, this Tsukiyomi card is being played in every single one of them. I better pick these up. Tsukiyomi's were only three, four, five dollars. You could have easily picked up four or five copies of the card and then, you know, waited until ABCs had their first week of regionals when they basically were, you know, topping everything and they get third and fourth place at their first YCS and boom, you bought the card at $5 and then you're immediately able to sell it at like $25. In fact, there are some current examples that actually we're probably going to see and some that we've already started seeing. You know, I've been talking about Treat Toad Heroes on my channel for quite a while, right guys? Like, uh, you know, my last tournament, I was talking about them and people say I was hyping them up, but look at cards like Emergency Call, right? So we all know that every Mass Hero deck ever is gonna run E-Calls. This was a card that not too long ago was was $3.85 and we now see it's a $9 card. It's basically almost tripled in value because everybody who wants to play, you know, totally awesome heroes is looking to bling out their deck. People are looking to pick up, you know, e-calls as like hollows. They're looking to get the secret rare copies of a hero lives and cards like that. If you would have picked this stuff up maybe a couple of months ago, these cards would have been dirt cheap and you could have sold them for, you know, 60% profit or something like that. You know, you look at Infernoids. This is actually one that I'm probably going to invest in myself. Now, some of the Infernoid cards have already gone up like Davion and um, like the ultimate copies of like Onochu. Both of these are like hitting $15 or $13, $14, $15. But look at some of these other cards, right? Look at the uh, secret rare copies of Onochu and uh, he has been reprinted in the Mega Tens, I believe last year. So right now, this card is basically nothing, guys. I mean, everybody watching this video can afford a dollar, right? I would assume 99 cent here, $1 here. I think the Mega Pack versions are actually only like 70 cent, but honestly, I might buy all of these up. Just kidding, just kidding. Not gonna do that, not a scumbag. So let's say that you believe, like I believe, that Infernoids are gonna be a very, very good deck when Raging Tempest comes out, and you decide that you're just gonna make the smallest of investments. Let's say you buy one copy for a dollar, right? You watch this video, and like, ah, I can buy, I can buy one copy from a kid at my locals or something like that. Let's say when Infernoids come out in the TCG, they do very well. And they don't even have to do well on the YCS level for the market to spike. They can just end up topping a regionals or getting, you know, eighth at a couple of regionals. You guys know in your heart that this card would probably instantly shoot up to like, I don't know, anywhere from eight to ten dollars. And it's like you put in one dollar and then you can immediately, as that happens, sell this card for nine or eight dollars. And it's like your profit levels are just really, really good. Like if, if you do that over and over, and over again that's how you end up either building up a very big collection where you can liquidate cards at any given time to try and you know buy a whole bunch of new cards that you just kind of want to play or you can even just kind of, you know, use that money constantly, like buy cards, flip them, don't even hold a collection. And you can constantly use that as kind of like a little micro business. But that's a lot of times how a lot of players who are very heavy in the secondary market, that's how they pay for new cards and they pay for a new product. And, you know, they kind of, it makes it a lot easier to kind of play the game because let's say that's just for argument's sake, I don't know, you could identify that Pot of Desires was like a really, really amazing card, borderline broken. A lot of people thought that it was a very divine 
divisive card, myself included. You had everybody saying from, you know, it, it sucks, and some people were like, it's great. What if you would have bought, I don't know, five copies of Pot of Desires when it came out at 35 bucks? Even though that is a huge investment, sometimes you might have to, you know, take a little bit of a loss. Like, all right, it didn't really pan out. You know, I spent $165 on five pot of desires and I sold them back at a $30 loss. It happens sometimes. But if you ended up, you know, holding onto the card and selling it when it was $90, like you would have made a killing. Like you would have made enough money to basically just buy, like, I don't know, a fucking case or like half a case of Raging Tempest when it comes out. Like, let's say you really have your heart set on playing the Zodiac beast or you would have had enough money just off of that one deal alone to buy like three copies of dimension barrier three totally awesomes you know the entire paleozoic like you'd had everything paid for new decks that come out when you want to play them so i think uh dipping in the secondary market it can be a little risky but there's just a lot of money to be made and it don't you don't really have to feel bad about it because like the way that i look at it is people are always willing to pay these prices even if you're not you have to think of it like this even if you're not willing to pay 160 dollars for a necros of Brionic, look how many people were playing necros last year <laughs> like obviously people are Yu-Gi-Oh has had a history of having 150 dollar cards and i don't really see that changing anytime soon because desires is just another hundred dollar card so let me know what you guys think do you guys think that it is a legitimate strategy to kind of invest in the secondary market? Because honestly, I've been playing this game way too long not to have really messed around in the secondary market. And I personally think I'm going to start doing it, you know, maybe taking like $200, just setting it to the side and just buying a whole bunch of cards that I think are going to go up in value so that when they go up, I'm not kind of just sitting there like, damn, man, I got to pick up those cards. You know what I mean? I could just instantly sell them and just keep it moving. And then, you know, when the next hot deck comes out, you know, whatever comes out the lunar lights i don't have to spend a dime on it because i've already made my money and that money that i make can kind of just pay for that so anyways if you guys enjoyed the video or found it informative please give it a like and subscribe if you have not already and actually there's one more thing that i want to talk about i'll try and make it quick and it's basically knowing when to liquidate or get rid of kind of like junk hollows that you have and i don't mean like the ones from like the hidden arsenal set the ones that absolutely nobody wants i mean ones from core booster sets a lot of times they'll be like ultra rares and they'll be secrets a lot of times they're archetype specific and you kind of just know that they're past their prime you don't have a lot of use for them these cards could value anywhere from a dollar fifty to like three dollars and you think oh what's really a dollar fifty but the thing is i've already proven guys that you can take a one dollar investment and you can flip that for a profit i mean bujin uh, mikazuchi is a prime example this card's only worth about a dollar and 80 cents but would you rather have this right now or would you rather have an anochu when it's already been seen that infernoids are doing well in the ocg and that card's probably going up like of course you'd rather have the anochu so why not take a card like this potentially sell it to maybe a bujin fan out there who just wants the card and then take a card that's highly marketable i mean maybe you have to hold on to the onochu for for a few months but in those months what are the odds that mikazuchi is going to become like a card that is the one that people are desiring that one you know that people are chasing like it's very unlikely unless something crazy happens like um and maximum crisis there's some new card that like breaks bujins or something like that but that's the unknown and we really can't account for the unknown the known is that onochu is probably going to be a card in demand so there are just many examples like that i'm using onochu over and over again because that's just a really cheap example that everybody can kind of you know look at but there are just tons of other examples where you can look at cards you see that the card's only like a dollar but you might predict it might be like three dollars so your old cards that you're not getting any value out of and make sure that you hold on to cards that may just be bad in this form Format. like a lot of people don't like a fat veiler right now even though blue eyes was you know it was kind of pushing it because they could search it just just because things like maxi and winter cherries are better but a fat veiler is never going to be a terrible card guys there's no reads there's no reason to sell your ultra effect veilers and your like ultimates for like dirt cheap when you can hold them for maybe like four or five months new format rolls around new deck comes out and effect veiler might be like an amazing card and it might be better than maxi in that format and you know you would have, have wasted time kind of like selling it low and you could have just held on to it so sell cards that you don't think you're going to get much value out of even if you're only making like a dollar here and there because you can take that dollar and do big things with it